Let's bow before we bring the word today. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of John. And Lord, we know that you have a special message here for people that are listening. God, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would just, Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. You're welcome in our hearts. Would you just teach us, Lord, uh, exactly what it is that you would like us to, to, uh, to absorb and to, and to put into practice this morning, Lord. God, help us to uh, just have a, a good time together here in the Word, and, and Father, would you just bless this in Jesus' name, and help me to explain it in a way that would honor you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this Sunday, we're continuing in um, Jesus' discussion with the Jews as he taught on the Temple Mount, and this was after the Feast of Tabernacles. So last week, I shared with, uh, with you how Within this group of people, there was a fairly good, a large group of people that met Jesus as he was teaching after the Feast of Tabernacles on the Temple Mount. Jesus began to make statements that, uh, of claim, and he began to tell people who he was um, in a clearer way than he ever had before. And uh, last week I explained that there were some people that believed and who actually thought, yes, this could be our Messiah, and then there were the religious leaders who were hostile towards Jesus because he didn't support them or their traditions and the way that they had been leading the people. So here we have this, so we have this mixed group. This is the setting. Jesus is teaching on the Temple Mount. There's this setting with this divided group of people, some who supported him and some who were antagonistic towards him. So today in our text, we're going to be exploring the subject of the true identity of Christ because the true identity of Jesus Christ is laid out uh, in the Gospel of John in this place. So this morning our text is found in John chapter 8 verses 31 or 30 to 58. So even as he spoke, verse 30 says in John chapter 8, many believed in him. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So for before we continue, it's a powerful passage, a powerful statement, and we're going to spend some time on it. But before we continue in on that statement, exploring this passage, I'd like to take you back to where Jesus started his earthly ministry. Just after his baptism in the Jordan River and the overcoming of temptations that Jesus faced out in the desert, we read this. Jesus returned in Luke chapter 4, 14 to 17. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everybody praised him. Everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and as the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, and I'll read it from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 61, 1. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. And we read in that setting that all eyes were upon Jesus as he read this. And that was the start of his ministry and the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy given in Isaiah 61. See, from the beginning of his ministry, Jesus disclosed to the people listening that he was the Messiah and that he, in fact, had come to bind up the brokenhearted. Jesus, has, Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for captives, for the captives. 
and to release prisoners from darkness. He claimed to be the bread of life, as we've talked in his, his speeches on the sermon uh, on the, on the uh, temple mount here, right? He claimed to be the bread that was sent from heaven. He had also claimed in his ministry to be the water of life. And in his final statement, we talked about it in the past couple weeks here, Jesus claimed to be the light of the world. Not just a light in the world, but the light of the world. So we read in verse 30 of our text this morning that Jesus, as he continued to teach on the Temple Mount, many people responded positively to his message. Many people put their trust in him. Many people believed in him. Coming to believe in Jesus, friends, we know this. It's the first step. It's the first step. If you want to, to be a Christian, okay, you must take that initial step of confessing Jesus with your lips, of, of acknowledging him and saying, Lord, I want to know you. Turning away from your sin, walking towards him, the bread of life, the one who sets the darkness, uh, sets people free from the darkness, the light of the world. So Jesus emphasized that the pathway to becoming his authentic disciples, though, was not just the first initial step. It's great when you see, isn't it awesome when you see someone get saved? They come into that relationship with Christ and they're just, okay, here I am, Lord. Here I am. And Jesus takes his, his uh, super cleaning power and, and scrubs that heart clean from sin. And, and if, if you've experienced this as a believer, it's such a good feeling inside. The grass is greener, right? The birds are singing a sharper tune and, 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 and it's just more crisp and beautiful and you just feel so light. Well, that's because sin is a weight and your burdens are, are dealt with at Calvary and that, that's great. But that's not where it ends. It's not just your, your, your experience with God is not just coming to Him in your initial conversion. That's not what it's all about. And some people treat it like that. Yes, I've resolved things with God. Now I can just continue living life the way I want to live it. Hmm. That's not what he is after. You see, God is after cleansing us from our sin so that he can make his home within us in the Holy Spirit's presence. You were made like... There's a God-shaped vacuum in each one of you that was made as a place for God to dwell in His person. You are made to be the temple of the Most High God, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ, sacrifice on the cross, makes a way for that to happen. But coming to believe in Jesus, that's just the first step. Jesus emphasized, and this is what we want to talk about this morning, He emphasized... That the pathway to becoming authentic disciples was to hold to his teaching. Not only to take a step, but to take a step in and surrender. See, it's not just about taking a step and then stepping back and going, I've got fire insurance now. Now I can just go do what I want. No, that's not authentic Christianity. That's not authentically what God desires. God desires for us to take a step towards Him and abandon ourselves, our sin nature, and say, Lord, deal with my sin nature. Take, it away. take, take my sin away and come and live inside me. And I want to follow you. So, so Jesus emphasized the pathway to becoming authentic disciples was to hold to His teaching. In other words, to be a disciple of Christ, it means to abide in Him, to abide in His teaching, to live by following the Word of God. In other words, to be an authentic Christian means to be a Christ-like one, to take a step into becoming 
like Jesus. One who has not only an encounter, but one who commits his or her life to obeying the word of God. Now, there were some in the crowd listening to Jesus that day who, like many people today, are attracted to something that Christianity offers. They're attracted to or somewhat intrigued by some of the things that Jesus teaches or endorses. They considered themselves to be Christians in the sense that they liked some of what Jesus said. They really did. But as they go along their way, they come across some of the teachings of God in His Word that they find hard to swallow. I like A and B, but I'm not too crazy about C and D. There's things in in the Bible, the teachings in the Bible, they don't care too much about because those teachings are in conflict with the way that they want to live their lives. Now, when listening to Jesus' teachings, and we see it all over the place, it's easy to become cherry pickers, if you know what I mean, who take what we like and find personally beneficial but then push aside and avoid the things that we don't like. There's a powerful temptation to adopt this mindset. Because for us, we live in a consumer society, and people are consumers of things. So in a consumer society, you take what is helpful to you, and then you walk away from what isn't. It becomes, to some people, more helpful in life to use Christ than to know Him and to follow Him. When we fall into this temptation, it, this temptation actually comes from the evil one. That you can come to know Christ, but just continue the way that you want without fully surrendering to Him. When we fall into this temptation... We use Jesus to make ourselves feel better, maybe. Um, maybe to develop a plan for making our lives work or for receiving blessings that come from following God for me. And hoping that we'll get everything that we need to make us happy. But in the process, subtly, the Lord Jesus becomes something different than what he was truly meant to be. He becomes your own personal Jesus. Someone who's there, someone who cares, someone to answer your prayers. Someone who is worshipped for what he might offer. Someone who stirs our spiritual curiosity, but not someone who is truly pursued to get to know because he is worth getting to know. Or worship for who he genuinely is or what he teaches in the whole counsel of his word. Cherry picking. And boy, we have a, a society in North America of Christendom that has a real problem with this. I think it's been a problem all the way through. And this is, Jesus is addressing, he's addressing this. Right before the start of his ministry, Jesus was in the desert. Now, we mentioned that. And he was tempted. See, Jesus, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights out in the desert. And it was immediately after his fast that Jesus was tempted by the devil with three very powerful temptations. In his first temptation, Satan asked Jesus to use his power to make bread out of the stones around him to satisfy his own physical hunger. In Matthew 4, 1-4 we read, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Wouldn't you be hungry if you fasted that long, kids? If you didn't have food for 40 days and 40 nights, you'd be starving. 
You'd be famished. Everything would look like food. You'd look at those rocks. Ooh, that looks like a piece of bread. Ah, nope, that's not bread. But the tempter came to Jesus and he said, If you are the Son of God, tell those stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You may ask, well, what's wrong with Jesus taking those stones and making them into bread? He was really hungry. And there's nothing wrong with satisfying your hunger, is there? Especially in a, in a circumstance where you're very weak and you need food. But what about in a spiritual time of fasting? Why, is this, why was this a temptation? Why would it have been a sin for Jesus to yield to that? You see, my friends, hunger represents human wants. Plain and simple. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights to focus on the spiritual and away from the physical. That is, the comforts of life because he was devoted to doing the work of God more than anything. And that's where his focus was to be. And Satan came telling him to use his divine powers to meet his own physical needs. When his mission was not to satisfy his own physical wants, his mission was to do the will of his Father. Not to satisfy his own desire. And that is why he said in response to the devil, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. See, God wants his disciples to be people who hold to the teachings of His Word. Not just to use the power of God's Word to meet our own self-centered physical needs and interests. In Jesus' words from Luke chapter 9, 23, then He said to them all, Whoever wants to be My disciple must deny themselves and take up their crosses daily and follow Me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit their very self? See, Jesus said he wants us to take up our crosses daily. What is a cross? It's a symbol that we use for churches. Kids, you see this, right? You see crosses all over the place on churches, right? But you know, the symbol of, cro- of the cross is a symbol of death. And the, and the symbol of the cross to the Christian is a symbol of dying to self, to become a follower and a disciple of Christ. This means it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And God's desire is that I live for Him, for His interests, for His kingdom to come, for His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. God will supply our daily bread. We say, give us this day our daily bread. And he knows what we need before we even ask it, but our pursuit of Christ is not for our own personal benefit. It's not so that we can make our own personal Jesus the way we want to craft him, where we take what we want and we spit out what is repugnant to our flesh. Sometimes, Serving the Lord means giving up stuff that is difficult to give up because our flesh craves it. But the Lord will give us His strength. He promises it. If you're truly His disciples, you will hold to His teaching. And this is what the promise is here. He will give you what you need. Never will He leave you. Never will He forsake you. He's not going to let you Uh, He's not going to cast you aside when you need something. Give us the stay or daily bread. It's okay to pray that. But our focus needs to be, give me this day, Lord, a heart that is submitted to you so that your will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. And yes, Lord, you know what I need before I even cry. Give us this day our daily bread. And not just that, but Lord, give us this daily bread in the Spirit. Because you know that you can't do anything without the grace of God. You can't walk without the grace of God. You can't live a life that pleases Him without the grace of God. You can't come to Jesus without the grace of God. Grace is undeserved merit that's bestowed upon us by the Lord. You can't do anything without Him. But He has given you all things because He desires you to be alive in Him and to live abundantly in Him. God calls us to be willing to surrender our own physical desires of self-gratification to serve God's holy purposes. What is God's holy purpose for your life? I can tell you this much. The first step is that He wants you to be like Jesus And what was Jesus like? Jesus was a foot washer. Jesus went out of his way, stooped down, and got on his hands and knees. The creator of the universe who spoke the galaxies into into existence bent down and washed his disciples' feet, took a lowly position of a servant. If you want to follow Christ and hold to his teachings, you must be willing to be a servant of all. This is not about me and my personal Jesus, one who answers my prayers and meets all my needs for me. This is a Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Jesus. A disciple making Jesus. What is a disciple? That's a good question. I'm going to answer that. What is a disciple? One who holds to the Master's teaching, holds to it, who abides in the Word, and on His Word does He meditate day and night. You see, the Lord desires us to be students of His Word, to be followers of Him, not only to be hearers of the Word, but doers also. And it's an exciting life to live in that state of of being. Because when you become a follower of Christ, and you follow Him wholeheartedly. Oh, the glory of God. The glory of God visits earth. (laughs) Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? As a temple of the Holy Spirit, what are you? You are His ambassadors. And when you speak to the people that God puts in your pathway... You are to speak as though God himself was speaking through you because he is. And when the word of God is hidden in your heart, fountains of living water come flowing from within you to talk to and touch and impact the lives of the community that God has placed you in. Yes, God will bless you. He will take care of all of your needs. But that is, you see, that's God wants that to be the side issue in us. It's not my own, it's just for me. It's, it's that I am poured out like a drink offering, like Paul says, on the sacrifice. Why? To God be the glory, great things He has done. To God be the glory, great things He has done. And He calls me to participate with Him in His great work. Each of us has a calling. Each of us has a purpose. I don't know what... Your purpose is because that's between you and God because you have a specific designed individual purpose that God has for you to serve Him. And when you serve Him, you'll become alive in Him. And when you become alive in Him, your life will be changed. You will be impacting in the world that God has planted you in. You're going to create maybe people that will get angry with you, but you'll also create people that will go, what have you got that I don't have? Please take me to your source. This is God's desire. This is His desire. So the wonderful thing about losing your own life in Jesus is that you actually find the truth. When you give your life to Him, when you give Him your life, instead of trying to save it and savor it for yourself, 
when you give it to the Lord, then you find life abundant. And the truth, when you follow the Lord and hold to His teachings, the truth will set you free. And He who the Son has set free, He shall be free indeed. Amen? God has come for the purpose of truth. Jesus said, for this reason, I came to testify to the truth. That's what He said before Pilate. And it is so good because testifying to the truth is setting people free. When you hold to truth, when you hold to the word of God, to the truth, my what is truth? My word is truth. When you hold to the word of truth, you hold fast to it and you pursue it, you, you soak it in. Not just 15, 20, 30 minutes when you go to your Bible study or half an hour when you go see the pastor preach. But every day, feasting on the Word of God. What is truth? My Word is truth. And when the truth gets in, embedded in your spirit to the point where it is no longer you that live, but it's Christ that lives in you, then whom the Son shall set free shall be free indeed. You want to experience freedom in the Lord? I do. Do you want to experience freedom in the Lord? I pray that you do because God desires that you be free. He desires that you be free. And you don't become free by being selfish with your energy and everything that you have and gathering it to yourself. That's not the source of, that's not the way to freedom. The freedom is when you take it before the Lord and you go, God, everything that I am and everything that I have, it belongs to you. Would you take my life and let it be an offering to you, Lord God? This is where abundant living comes because the spirit of the living God anoints you to live your life in a way that is full of freedom. He sets you free from the bondage of sin and of death. And this is what God desires. Oh, the sovereign God offers us a choice. What will it be this morning? On the internet, you're listening? What will it be? you got choices to make. Like these guys that were listening to Jesus on the Temple Mount, you have choices to make. What will it be? Will it be my way or will it will be God's way? I can pull back and try and turn Jesus into this personal thing that just satisfies me. My own personal Jesus. Customized specifically to do what I want him to do. Or, Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When the light shines in the darkness, will we yield to the light of the world or will we pull away from it? The sovereign God offers a choice. First John 1 to 9, 9 and 10 says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. See, this is exactly what happened with these religious guys. There, there were those that said, yeah, Jesus, I want to be your disciple. But there was those that went, you know what? I like some of what you say, but you know what? That You're going too far, buddy. You're going too far, Jesus. They answered him. For those with that kind of heart, they answered him in verse 33 and said, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Man, it's amazing how people can get spiritually deceived. Isn't it? In my, in my life, in my path along the way, there's been times in my life where I, I can honestly say that I've been spiritually deceived. I bought a lie and I followed it thinking that I was doing the right thing. But in fact, I wasn't. Hey, it's easy to happen. Be careful. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Guard your heart above all things. It's the wellspring of life. You can be susceptible to whispers in your ear that are not of God. And these guys, it's amazing how blind they were. Here's Jesus, the Messiah, who just finished feeding 5,000 people, 5,000 men with a you know, a few five loaves and two, uh, two fish. Got you know healing people. 
setting blind eyes to see, crippled people walking, all this. Here's Jesus doing all this stuff, and these guys knew it. They seen it, but they wouldn't believe they, because it just didn't fit their system. You see, they, they, they're like, we're not, how can you say that we need to be set free? We've never been slaves of anyone. See, before someone can get free, they must, in fact, understand and accept the fact that they are slaves to whatever has mastered them. So before you can see freedom in your life, you have to acknowledge the areas where you're in captivity. Only when we recognize our true, tra- uh, true state of being will we reach out to one who can free us from slavery. Many upon hearing the invitation to Christ's freedom that comes through submitting to Jesus inwardly say, no, I'm good. No, I'm good. So these guys are doing. No, we're good. We're good. You ever had that? Uh, you try to talk to someone about Jesus. No, no, I'm good. That Jesus stuff might be good for some people. It might be good for you. But I don't need it. It's a crutch. I'm fine. I don't need a Savior. I'm just going to live my life the way I want it. You see the deception? The reality of it is that person is one step away from their last breath and an eternity of separation from God in hell. That's, that's heart-wrenching. It's heart-wrenching. They don't realize how lost they really are until the lights get turned on by the Holy Spirit. They've got to be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to them and not shed the word that comes on them like the hardened ground that we talked about last week. In the physical realm, we have Jewish religious leaders listening to Jesus speak. And they're like, we've never been slave to anyone. Had they forgotten? Look at the history of the people. Had they forgotten that they were slaves in Egypt for 400 years? Their children of Abraham were slaves of e- in Egypt for 400 years. Had they forgotten about how the disobedient ten northern tribes were swept away by the king of Assyria and taken into service for Assyria away from their country? Had they forgotten how how Jerusalem fell and was ransacked by the Babylonians and how their people were dragged out of the city with fish hooks through their mouths into slavery? Had they forgotten that? They, they were deceived into saying, no, we we're fine. I'm fine. Because not only were they historically enslaved, but they were a slave to sin. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So here's Jesus setting the framework for what he was going to do for humanity, his work on the cross. He tells those who are listening that everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And we're talking a person who is habitually bound by patterns of sinning. The prisoner is free when he is no longer in prison. The slave is free when he or no longer is under legal control of his owner. See, in slavery, you're owned by someone. Everyone has a master, the Bible says. You can either be a slave of the God of this world, the the chief of liars, or you're going to be a slave to the God who created the heavens and the earth, a slave of righteousness. Either way, you're going to be a slave Whether you think so or not, you're going to be. Jesus here sets the stage for his work on the cross, telling those who listen to him that everyone who sins is a slave to sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
every single human being from the time of Adam onward has been a slave to sin. He says in 37, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you're doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, Jesus said, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did no such thing, did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says, and the reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. What the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 is so true. It's true back then and it's true today. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Further to this, people who resist the word of God believe they can partake in Jesus on their own terms that they can separate what they like about what God's teaching is and obey that, yet disobey parts of his teachings that they do not like. Friends, this is not true Christianity at all. That is not biblical Christianity. In John, 1 John 3, 4-10, the Apostle John makes it abundantly clear. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he has appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Did you hear that? This is not the word of Pastor Clint. This is the word of God, the teaching of the Almighty God. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or knows him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. I just want to pause for a second here. It's not talking about making errors as you go through life and sinning in, in falling into sins. Okay? What it's talking about here is willful patterns of living in sin. The Bible does say that if anyone does sin, there is an advocate on his behalf. And he is faithful and just to cleanse us from our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So if anyone sins, and that's all of us at times, okay, what we're talking about here is an unwillingness to give up a life of sin. A life of sin's pattern. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. Pretty strong words, isn't it? Sobering words. Friends, God does not just save us 
by grace through faith so that we can continue living as our own nature desires. God saves us by grace through faith so that we can be overcomers in this life and come into the light of God's Holy Spirit, obeying Him and being freed from the power and dominion of the devil. You are not slaves any longer to sin if you are born again in Christ. Don't give any room for your sinful nature. Turn to the Lord. Yes, and when you make mess it up, come right back to Him in repentance. From the time of Adam and Eve eating that forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden until today the human race has been plunged into deadness that has come through sin. And the voice that is listened to when people sin is the voice of the deceiver, our ancient enemy Satan. Those who were opposed to Jesus on the Temple Mount didn't realize that they'd been deceived into believing lies. They thought that God was with them when in fact they were not living for God but for themselves in God's name. They were actually living in slavery to sin and the slave driving master of sin is the devil. That's why Jesus said, you're listening to your father. The devil is your father. Their darkened understanding was open to the whisper of evil forces who convinced them that they were the righteous ones and that Jesus was the sinner. How warped is that? And that their way of living and doing things was right and Jesus and his way of doing things was wrong. White is black and black is white. Right is wrong and wrong is right. I think I just lost my appetite. <laughs> Stop the world, I want to get off. No. This is... This is the reality we live in, right? And, and, and this, this, the Messiah was there speaking his word of truth. And what did they do? He fed the 5,000. He healed the sick. His blind eyes were open. What did they do? They respond in 48. We're going to read it. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and that you are demon-possessed? Oh, I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my Father and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this they exclaimed, Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets, yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, who you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. And if I said I did not, I'd be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and he was glad. You're not yet 50 years old. They said to him, and you have seen Abraham? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself slipping away from the temple grounds. So at the end of chapter 8 here, again with greater clarity than ever, Jesus reveals to the people who he is. Kids, Jesus is not just a story that you get told in Sunday school or that you read in a book at home or, the, or that, you, that you read about in the Bible even. He's not, he's not just a story. The Bible is truth and is telling you what, G, what God truly did in, in coming to the earth and making himself the savior of the world to save people like you and me from their sins. 
the same one who spoke the universe into existence was standing before his people on that day. And the same one who created the universe stands before and knocks on the door of your heart today. But sadly, so many people have Jesus come to them and speak the truth to them. And they go, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. That might be good for you. But I can do things my own way, and that's not good for me. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. Folks, there is no two truths. It is either true, it's either true or it's a lie. It's either truth or a lie. Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way unto the Father except by me. If you want to know God here today, the only way is by coming to Jesus and accepting what he says and becoming a disciple one who holds to his word or abides in his word. See, the same Jesus in Exodus chapter 3 visited Moses when he, Moses was called to facilitate the freeing of the Israelites from slavery. And when, when Moses met God in the burning bush, he's like, okay, I'll go to Egypt, but who, do you, who should I say sent me? In verse 14 of Exodus 3, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And when Jesus stood before those people to, and they were questioning him, he says, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was, I am. So God is calling you today to walk and hold to the teachings of his word, to be his disciples. Disciple is one who follows his master, who imitates his master, who is an ambassador for his master. Yet not everyone rejected Christ. There were people on that temple mount that day who didn't reject him like these guys were. And that's what it says in John chapter 1, 11 and 12, and it's true here today because I believe sitting amongst us is a whole group of people who have said yes to Jesus that they want to follow Jesus. They want to be his disciples. They want to live for him. In John 1, 11 and 12, and we'll end with this, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor human decision or husband's will, but born of God. So the question is today, what are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with him? As a true disciple, hold fast to his teachings. Crave and, and bathe and, and consume the word of God and let the truth set you free because you are free in Christ. Amen? Amen. And if you're out there today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can come to know him today. Humble your heart before him and ask him to be your Savior and your Lord. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for everything that you are and everything that you do. We thank you for revealing yourself to the Jews on the Temple Mount that day so long ago. And God, you continue to reveal yourself to us here today as well. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the same today as you were yesterday and the same as you will be forever. We worship you, God. 
and we ask that you would just bless our congregation of believers here. Lord, bless us to do your work. And God, we know that you will meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.